Hey guys, welcome to another video on my channel. I'm Trevor Williams and today we're going to be looking at building a minimal API and spooling up all of the CRUD endpoints in a matter of seconds using a library called Instant APIs. So we're going to be going through those activities. I'll be using .NET 7, which at the time of this recording is still in preview. However, everything that we're going to do is available in .NET 6. So whichever version it is you want to try it with, then that's fine by me. If it is your first time on this channel, I firstly appreciate your support clicking and viewing this video and I'd further appreciate the support if you could click like, subscribe and leave a comment and leave other video requests so that I can better curate content to meet your needs. So let's get right into it. So I am going to be using Visual Studio 2022 and we're going to go ahead and create a new project. So of course, I'm assuming that you already have Visual Studio 2022 installed and you have access to the .NET 6 framework, of course, by virtue of having .NET, I'm sorry, Visual Studio 2022 installed. So let's create a new project and I'm going to go for a web API project. So you should see SP.NET Core Web API. If you don't see it, that means you probably are missing the workload that is required. So you can scroll all the way to the bottom of all the templates, click install more tools and features that will launch the installer, and then you can add the ASP.NET web workload. So let us proceed with the core API, and I'm just going to say instant API project. So that is very clear. So instant API project, hit next. And then, like I said, I'll use the dotnet 7 preview for this tutorial but if you don't want to use that you can use dotnet 6 which is also perfectly fine and then for authentication type we'll skip all of that that's not necessary we will uncheck to use minimal apis and we can leave open api support so let's go ahead and hit create all right so once our project is up and created if you're not familiar with minimal apis you can always check out my other youtube video where i walk you through what the minimal api is how it differs from the controller based approach and how you can build out a full api and do crud operations using this methodology but if you are familiar with it then we can proceed we can just jump right to the program.cs because that's where all the magic happens when it comes to minimal API. So here we build all of our services or we add all of our services up until this point rather. And then after this, we build the app and then all of our endpoints are really defined using app.map uh, and then the verb. So map get, map put, map post, etc. So whichever HTTP verb from API development that you need, then that's where they all go. So let us, I'm going to remove all of this boilerplate stuff because we're going to be building our own API. So let me not get too frivolous with that. So let me remove the sample weather forecast as well as the sample data here and the sample endpoint. So we're left with just the app run. Now, one of the main ideas behind minimal API development is that you can stick everything in just one file. I mean, it's minimal. That might not necessarily tie in with your traditional coding ambitions where you'd want to have distinct files to do distinct things. But for the purpose of this experiment or this exercise, we're just going to stick everything in one file. Maybe later on we can, you know, farm it out and properly segregate it. But just to keep it simple, let's just do it all here. So I'm going to create a new class and, uh, or I can just uh, record and let us call this student. So we're going to do a sample application or a sample API for schools and their respective students, right? So a student is going to have an int ID property string. Let's just say name, just to keep it simple. An ID and a name and an int school ID because every student needs to belong to a school, right? Then we're also going to have school. So record school and the school is going to have an ID. It's also going to have a name and let's say email address or contact email. 
Now, you see the naming convention here, it's suggesting that I say string school name. Personally, whenever I'm naming a table, <laughs> I don't see the point in putting back the name of the table on the property. So that's why you see me use ID and not student ID. However, with entity framework, if you were to say student ID, it would still detect this as a primary key, just the same, just in case you weren't familiar with how entity framework works. So just by saying the table name and appending ID, or just by saying ID, Entity Framework, when it is doing the scaffolding, will actually take those into consideration and automatically make those the primary key without any effort from you outside of that following that naming convention. However, for on, on a more personal note, and this is how I teach even my students in, in person, I always say, I already know I'm in the student table, so I don't prepend my columns with the student, with the table name, right? So that's ID, that's name. I wouldn't say student name or student first name and student last name. And I'm actually just being lazy here. Let me stop being lazy and actually say first name and last name. That's better, right? So first name and last name. And then we have the school ID. This is the foreign key. So after this, it will infer that this is a foreign key to that table. And so for the school, I'm not going to say string school name because I already know I'm in the school table. However, some people do follow that naming convention and it probably works out better for them in the long run, but that's fine. So let's proceed. So after setting up the record and the school, I need a DB context. So I'm going to create a class. I'm going to say class DB context. And actually I should call it school DB context. And this school DB context needs to inherit from DB context. So DB context is the default class given to us by entity framework. So here we're getting an error and it's, you know, we are getting the error because we need entity framework added to this project. So let's right click on the project file, get manage uh, new, get packages, go over to browse. And you can just wait a bit. What we're going to use is SQL Lite. So we're using Entity Framework with SQL Lite. So I can actually just look for Entity Framework Core. Yes, those are popping up, but those are not the ones that I really, really want. So there are a number of Entity Framework Core libraries that you'll see here. You'll see here one for SQL Server. If you install that, it comes with that one built in, the core library built in, but the one that we're going after is Entity Framework Core SQLite. Now, another thing to note is I'm using the include pre-release because I'm using .NET 7. If you're not using .NET 7, then of course you wouldn't need the include pre-release and you should be able to proceed just the same. So I'm going to proceed with the SQLite. I'm not, as I said, I'm keeping it simple. We're keeping it simple. So I'm not going to go for the SQL Server one and set up SQL Server. And so we're just going to keep it simple with a SQLite, but the same principles would apply. And that's what makes Entity Framework so great because we could almost swap out the database providers without much attrition at the application level. So we can go ahead and install and accept any license agreements that pop up. I'm also going to go for another library called SQLite.com. Core. So we can just go ahead and search for SQLite.core and we want to go ahead and get this one. So it's a Microsoft.data.sqlite.core. So go ahead and install that package also. All right. And while we're here, we're still going to go on and get Microsoft Entity Framework Core tools. So the tools, Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore.tools, that will allow us to run some migration commands. So you can see here, these are the migration commands. And if you're not entirely sure or very confident with Entity Framework Core, you can always check out my course on Entity Framework Core. The link will be in the description. So we can go ahead and install that tools package. Of course, accepting everything as we go along. And now that we have the main libraries that we need, we can continue to write some code. So now if I do control dot on this arrow, 
then Visual Studio will suggest that I add my using statement for Entity Framework Core. And with that using statement, I can proceed to put in some more code. So I need some DB sets here. So I can say public DB set. So whenever we're defining a table, we say public DB set, we add the table, the entity rather that the table should be modeled off. And then we add the table name. So the property name that we give to it is the table name, unless we explicitly override using some other configurations. But for ease, unless you have a specific situation where you need to do that, this is good enough. All right. So DB set and then students. And then I'm just going to duplicate that line. And the next one would be school. So we have students and we have schools breaking my own rules. So DB context, DB context, schools and students. Now, generally speaking, our DB context needs constructor. So you can just write CTOR, C-T-O-R, and then press tab twice. It will generate that stub. And then we have to add the DB con options. So this is very important. DB context options with the type bracket. And the type that goes in there is the same type that we're in, which is DB context, school DB context. And then we say, let's just call it options. And then we need to pass those options down to the base. So those options now would be coming from our configuration that we're going to be placing up top here about how this database should be initialized and should behave at startup. So right above the, let me put it here, above the Swagger inclusion, let us say that the DB path, so I'm just going to define a DB path and I'm going to say that path is dot slash, meaning the root folder slash the file name, which I'll just become, I'll just create school DB, school dot DB, because we're using SQLite. So we have to use a local, right? Then the connection, I'll just say var connection, con or connection, if you want to spell it out. The connection string is going to be a new SQL, SQLite connect. <laughs> so new SQLite connection. And that will require me to include that missing using library for the Microsoft.data.sqlite. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then I'm going to pass in the DB path, all right? And then the final part to this puzzle is to let our application know through builder.services add the DB context. And remember the DB context represents the abstraction of the actual database. So we're adding the DB context, school DB context here. And then we are going to define the options. So remember that same options thing that we just had to make note of. So I'm going to define that the options dot SQLite connection. There we go. So Visual Studio helps me right along the way. So let's review that. We're setting up a DB path. So we're using SQLite and we're setting the DB path. If we're using SQL Server, then that would be a connection to an actual server where our database is being hosted. So DB path here is because we're using SQLite, the, the database is going to exist physically on in whatever path you defined, right? So here it's going to exist physically in our project pretty much. And then we have the connection. So we're creating this as a new connection. So it will formulate what a connection string for SQLite should look like. And then we're going to say application or, or builder.services, which is the application, add the DB context. And this is the DB context. And we're using SQLite connection through that connection string. All right. And that's pretty much it for setting up entity framework in our project. Now, the next thing would be to actually create the database. So we can go to the package manager console. If you don't see it, at that position on where it is on my screen, on your screen, you can always go to tools, then go down to new get package manager and you can launch package manager console. All right. So this is just a command line interface, um, CLI that allows us to run certain commands. So like with entity framework, what I can do is add a migration and then I'll say created database. So that's the first migration that we're adding. Press enter. 
it's going to build the project make sure there are no errors and i got this error so it's saying an error occurred while accessing that continue that unable to create an object of type school db context that means i missed out some oh ooh, okay here here's the issue i'm sorry so we need a little more to just that db path I was going a bit quickly so let's do that part again so we are creating the what the connection string needs to look like so it's not just the path we actually need an actual string so let's clear that out create and i'm going to have an interpolated string where i'm going to say data source data source is equal to and then we put in db path all right so that is what our connection string for our SQLite database needs to look like at minimum, right? And then let us try that command again. So I'm just going to press up, try to add migration again, and there we go. So now we have a migration file and we got a new folder called migrations, created database, that is our migration. And you see here, it's just saying it's creating the tables. ID column is automatically auto-incrementing integers and primary key. All right, and what we're going to do is, okay, so one thing that foreign key relationship didn't get created here, and that is probably more my fault than anything. So if you make a mistake with the migration, you can always just say remove migration for it to undo. And I would recommend that anytime it's pointing out that you probably missed out something in the code, you go ahead and remove the migration. And what is missing? So after removing the migration, you can close that file and then let's go back over to the record for students. So typically when we use a class, because the class is more, you know, it's bigger so we can see everything. Typically we would put a property, what we call a navigation property in the record or in the model, the data model that has the foreign key to another one. So in this case, student is, designed to have a school ID, which is the foreign key to the school table. However, Entity Framework Core, because it doesn't see the navigation property, is not going to make that inference. So remember I was saying that by following the naming convention, certain things are inferred. Well, there's just one more thing that we have to do here so that Entity Framework can know that this should be a foreign key. So I'm going to add curly braces here, and then I'm going to add a property. I'll just say prop. And if you want, just for readability purposes, I'm just going to kind of widen this out so you can see where everything starts and stops. So we have the record here, we have the ID, first name, last name, school ID, and then adding a new public property. And this one I'm going to call school and school. So this is what we call the navigation property. So this property represents the related school record and entity framework will see this name and this name and then say, okay, so clearly this is the foreign key for this navigation property. We're getting this green line because it's saying that, well, this is never allowed to be null, which can lead to some validation problems. So I'll just make it nullable. There we go. So let us try to add the migration once more. And then this is sometimes a process, you know, you miss out something, that's why you inspect your migration file to make sure that everything looks the way you expect. So when I, scroll down now you see that it's actually creating that foreign key constraint on this record or on this column sorry so the foreign key and then it gives it the name and it's telling you that the school id column in the students table the principal table is schools and that is the the principal column so it's saying that yes there is a column here that should relate to the ID column in the schools table. And when you delete the school, also deletes that. Those are little things that you may want to change, but those are configurations I won't get into right now. But now that we have the migration, let us update the database. So the next command is update hyphen database. And we press enter and give that a few. And a few SQL statements later, we now have our school DB. 
right? Now, that the, the cool thing about Entity Framework is, yes, we're using SQLite, but these are the steps um, with almost any database. Once you're using Entity Framework Core as the ORM, what we just went through would work with an Oracle database. It would work with an MySQL database. If you had to do a code first approach, but you weren't able to use SQL Server and had to use a different type of database engine, Entity Framework Core more than likely has support for that. So now that we have our API project, we have our database and our DB context and everything. Let us look into actually creating the endpoints. Now, if you have checked out my other video on the minimal API, you would have an idea of how you can start building all those endpoints, right? But then in this video, we're looking at instant APIs as the way to just get started, right? So it's simple enough that we can just go and get the library. So I'm going to go to new get packages, right click, jump over to new get packages, browse again, and we're looking for instant APIs. So we're looking for that library and then we can go ahead and install, download and install that. And you see here, it comes with dependencies for Entity Framework Core and Swashbuckle, which is what gives us Swagger documentation. So let's go ahead and include that library. All right, so once that library is installed, let's jump back over to our program.cs file. And now we need to add a few lines of code. And remember that instant APIs is pretty much designed to just start to scaffold all of the endpoints that we need. So what we're going to do is uh, right underneath where we added the database services, we can say builder services dot add instant APIs. That's step number one. So we're adding that to our builder services and then below that, and I'll put this right above the HTTPS redirection, I'll say app dot map instant APIs. You may need to include some using statements, of course and then we'll give it the db context so we're saying map instant apis against whatever is in this db context please and then what this is supposed to do is go through the db context look at each db set and then look at each data model and then build scaffold just provide all the endpoints needed to support all of those operations right so let us take this for and i'll just run without debugging and let us see. And would you look at that? So with, I mean, setting up the database and, and all those configurations are given. You have to do that if you want a data-driven app. So I'm not going to count that as any manual effort. The manual effort really comes in when you have to put in the map get, the map put, the map post, and the delete, etc. So we didn't put in much manual effort outside of going and fetching the library. And here we have our full application based on all the tables that we created, all scaffolded out for us, ready to be used. So let's try, let's try creating a school. Let's, let's actually test it before we get too excited. So one of the downsides of course would be that you're actually dealing with the data models. So you have to bear that in mind. In recommended API design, it would be good that you abstract the exact fields that you need per endpoint so that you don't provide data points that are not necessary for a particular operation. So when I'm creating the school, I shouldn't have the option to provide an ID by right. I shouldn't provide an ID. So I'll leave that as zero. You could also delete it. But if you put in a value, you can expect an error because an ID should not be coming in. Anyhow, let's proceed. So with schools, let's say test uh, minimal API school, All right? So that's our first school. Let me execute and we are getting a 201, right? So even the response is everything. It's just there for us, right? We're getting the 201 created and we have ID one, minimal API school. And if I try to create a student to attend that school, once again, I'll leave this as zero, but school ID. So you see even here, the navigation properties is coming, right? So we have the option of providing a brand new school alongside a student. If we wanted to create a student for a specific school, of course, then I wouldn't need that part, but I would definitely need the school ID. 
And I'll just say string string and then let us try and create. And there we go. So we have this newly created student associated with the school with the ID one. If I did a get by ID, let's try this one out. So I'm going to get student with the ID one. Then we're getting back that 200 and everything is fine. So I think that this, this library is very, very useful. It's very powerful based on what I'm seeing. And I think it would be very useful for a very quick project, not necessarily an enterprise level project. The first time I used it, it didn't have support for keyless, uh, keyless tables. So I think they have fixed that subsequently. So even like if you have to scaffold views and so on, you know, database objects that don't have primary keys, then it used to have an error, it now supports it. However, for an enterprise application, I probably wouldn't use this library because you know there are a lot more things I would like to control. It could also mean that I need to go and do some more research on this library, but so far I give it a, I give it two thumbs up. If you need to demo something really quickly, it just create a few tables, go ahead and map out all of those endpoints, and then right there you have an instant API. So with all my explanation and everything, we did this in about 20 minutes, right? So without me explaining and walking you through, you could have had an API up and running in less than 15 minutes, right? So it's it's a pretty good library. Like I said, thank you guys for watching. Thank you for taking the time out to like this video, share it with a friend, and feel free to check out all the links in the description. I will leave the source code as well as other resources, or playlists, and courses that I have that support this kind of content and I'll see you in the next lesson.